Church in City of Troy. It is good that uh, we are able to gather again, that the Lord has blessed us with this uh, beautiful day, not quite as hot as uh, last week, and uh, got a little bit of breeze. Hopefully uh, we can engage a little bit more without feeling a little woozy from the sun. Um, let's stand, and uh, I'm going to read to us a call to worship this morning from Psalm 95, verses 1 through 3, as we begin our time here in worship. God's word has for us today, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Amen? Amen. Let's lift our voices this morning.
all this wind makes it a little difficult. Father, how we offer up this, this time to you, all that we do here, God, to point to your son, to sing the glory of your name, to lift high the name of Jesus. God, I pray that you would be with, with Pastor Ed as he comes and he shares your words this morning, that the people walking by would hear your words and be changed by your words. Let our hearts hear the words and receive the words that you have for us today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You should have a seat. Well, good morning again, Terra Nova Church in the city of Troy. It's our second week out here. Um, what a great thing. Uh, after four plus months, five months of not really being together, which is not normal for the church in any time, even in times of persecution and suffering, not to be able to gather 
And so it's good that we're able to do this. It's good that we're able to be here together on a beautiful day by the river here. And it's good that we're able to do that safely. Listen, I know some of you may wonder, why, why do we have to wear masks when we're singing? I saw studies that said singing doesn't push it as far as they originally thought. Well, one, that's if you're not singing loudly. And that's not my experience with people worshiping at Terra. So we're just going to do that. And we're going to be careful. There's nothing wrong with showing some care for people who may be exposed to uh, sickness because of us. So we're just, we're just going to be careful and make no apologies for that whatsoever. So I want to start us with a quote today. Edwin Hubble was a preacher in the, the 19th century with one of the unfortunate Ed names. Edward is the best among them with Edwin and Edgar. Um, but he, he said this, neutral men are the devil's allies. Neutral men are the devil's allies. What do you, what do you think of that quote? Now, I, I know there are places where being neutral is actually a good thing. So I'm not sure he means it. I certainly don't in all areas, right? Proverbs makes it real clear. To, to get involved in someone else's quarrel is like taking an angry dog by the ears. You shouldn't have jumped in. Now you're in a spot that you can't get out of. It's like when I see arguments on Facebook, which I'd say about 60% of are between the uninformed and the misinformed arguing. When I see that, I just stay out. There's no point. No, no one's really changed by your political arguments on Facebook. In case you didn't know that, take that home as the one thing you learned today. But when evil and good are constantly on one highway, driving at high speeds in opposite directions, to be neutral is to be like a person who decides to put their car perpendicular across that highway. Th there is no neutral when it comes to good and evil. And that's where Jesus is going to bring us today. We're in Matthew chapter 12. If you want to find your way there, we're going to be looking at only uh, verses 43 through 45. So just those three verses today. And we're going to come against the, the third in a series of teachings and warnings Jesus gives to a generation who sees him, hears him, knows his work, and yet doesn't find a place for him in their hearts. Here's where we'll go today. First, we'll talk a little bit about the Pharisees, revisiting them from who we talked about last week. Then we'll go into Jesus' illustration of, of how things are going to go wrong if your heart's only neutral towards good. And we're going to talk about the unclean spirits that he uses as an illustration for that. And then finally, what it means to turn our hearts towards God. Now, what it means to have a little bit, one section, a compartmentalized piece of God in your life. But to come to the place where you issue a full surrender of every area of your life to the Lord. Let's look at Matthew 12, 43 through 45. I'm going to read those three verses. I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll get into the word. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places, Jesus said, seeking rest but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation. Let's pray together. Gracious Father in heaven, your word declares every good and perfect gift comes from you. You are the supreme one. There is none like you, none above you. All those who cover the earth, regardless of their nation, background, heritage, economic status, education, need to have hearts that turn to you. So, Father, we ask for you to speak clearly in this time to us, in our inner person, that you would settle the things that are like static and misdirection away from you, that you would quiet the, the busy pieces that leave us passionate about the wrong things, and that you would help us, Lord, to tune in to what you have to say and to respond when we leave this moment. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so the Pharisees. Who are these guys? That if you read the Gospels and are even familiar in a cursory way with them, you see the Pharisees as these men who keep coming and confronting Jesus. They're constantly trying to test him, tempt him, prove him wrong, shame him, degrade him in front of other people. They are the key religious leaders in Judaism of that day. They, they love their power, which they see as the power to interpret all that Moses would say as Moses said it. They see themselves as the final arbiters of Jewish law, what they say and how they see it. 
They, they love the power and desperately fear losing it. They're constantly infused by their own sense of pride. The Bible says that they love being greeted in public places as rabbi, rabbi. But for religious leaders, they seem to lack faith. Last week we saw them saying to Jesus, after, after having heard him teach, seen his miracles, and heard of other miracles, they say we want to sign on demand, prove everything to us right now. We know later they will plot to murder Jesus. Here's if I had to summarize some key points about who these men are from the scriptures. They set their own standard of holiness. And it's so bad and so far off, Jesus says, when you make a convert, you make him twice as fit for hell as you were. They major on the religious minors and neglect what Jesus will call the weightier issues. They love their reputation more than their reality. They love appearing holy on the outside, but Jesus, like an x-ray of the soul, says, you're like a pretty coffin that's painted whitewashed, but is full of rottenness and unclean bones inside. They place heavy demands on people who seek to follow after them rather than helping these people. They pay lip service to the scriptures, but Jesus is constantly conflicting with them because they ignore them when they want to. They really make it hard for people to understand God's word and to believe God's word and to believe God is good. They're a detriment. As self-appointed protectors of the law, they're involved in just about everything religious that shows up to make sure it agrees with them properly. They show up when John the Baptist is baptizing people at the Jordan River, and when John sees them, as he's baptizing people who are repentant all day long, he looks at them and says, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? I mean, we think of John as a guy who's preaching goodness and holiness and repentance, and he is, but when he sees these guys, the reaction is that viscerally strong. And as for Jesus, they'll be adversaries right until the end when they conspire with Pontius Pilate to use the governmental power of Rome and the religious misdeeds of Phariseeism to murder Jesus publicly. Last week, they demanded a sign, a miracle, for Jesus to prove it right there on the spot. Jesus wouldn't bite because in the end, if he, if he offered proof, it would be the destruction of faith. No one would believe it was just empirical formula. You just repeat it, and if you were a smart one, you'd know it. And if you weren't, you wouldn't know it, but faith would be removed. Jesus responds to them and, and starts to correct them in his condemnations of them. He talks about the queen of the south, the queen of Sheba, who, who rose up and traveled from either southern Arabia or, or eastern Africa to go to hear Solomon speak in his court, spent her wealth, made gifts to him, looked. She was lacking and desired and found God through the scriptures. There's a point for them that they just don't hear. And then the story of Nineveh, a city that God said was full of great evil that rose up to heaven and the reluctant prophet Jonah goes and preaches and they repent and they end up worshiping God and a revival overcomes their city. And Jesus said both of these peoples, Ninevites and, and the queen of the south will rise up to condemn you. They said, the people of Nineveh, there goes my mask, <laughs> thanks Rachel, it's a ground in a second, nice, nice job Rachel Gardner. All right, so the Ninevites were, were clearly sinful people. Where, where the Queen of the South found the scriptures to find God, they found the experience of grace to find God, both critical for them. And now Jesus will give a third warning. It's a warning that says, repentance turns you away from something, but you need to fulfill that with something else. You, you can't just leave an absence. Nature abhors a vacuum. And so the illustration today of this person who has an unclean spirit, a, a demon. So let's pause. These are the things that make people curious when they read the Bible. What's it say about demons? What's it say about the end times? What's it say about miracles, right? They're the ones that excite us. When I first started reading the Bible with any seriousness, I was a 19-year-old sophomore at the University of Wisconsin sitting in my apartment. And so where did I decide to begin? The book of Revelation, of course, because the end, that'd be interesting. And I, I'm just one of those people. I mean, I. I need to know the end right from the beginning. I'm thinking about autumn on the first day of spring all day long. So I sat there and tried to read it and just found it unreadable until I fell asleep and then didn't bother with it again. But I think sometimes we get this way about the devil and demons. So a couple things to say that the Bible does teach. 
The Bible teaches that there is a devil. He's the source of evil and rebellion against God. So many times we can wonder, where does this evil come from in our world? How do we even find in ourselves now and again that we conceive thoughts that horrify us? We who were made in the image of God. And the scriptures say it was this one, this rebel, Satan, who fell and tempts and continues to do so today. Originally an angel, that designed to be a being of great light and great power, a messenger of God, he became an independent operator with a voice that was not of God and was contrary to God. And those who sided with him became his demons. They're in league with him. And he stands in league and with alliance with all those who stand against the image of God. John 8, 39 to 47 says this. They, the Pharisees, answered him, Jesus, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to him, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the work Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works of your father. They said to him, we are not born of sexual morality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to him, if God were your father, you would love him. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is you're not of God. So in this pointed argument with the Pharisee, he says, you're like the devil, and here's the family likeness that you bear. He starts with saying, you're, you're a liar, the father of lies. If there's a native tongue, a tongue that Satan would think, speak, dream in, talk to any of us in, it would simply be lying. From the very beginning, that was the way he did it with Adam and Eve. It was to, to give them one lie, one deception that would put this doubt in their minds that God was withholding from them by saying you shouldn't have that one fruit. It was that deception that began the fall. But make no mistake, the lies aren't there just to trick, confuse, cause trouble. He says he's a liar and a murderer, the father of lies and a killer. Not just to trick, but to destroy. In the end, listening to that voice, following that lead, following after Satan leads to death. It turns us against people. It divides, and as Jesus said, a house divided can't stand. Think back to Genesis. Adam and Eve are in the garden. They're at harmony with one another. They're praising each other. They love their roles. There's no division whatsoever. They both are loving their life under God, and Satan shows up and convinces first Eve, who then convinces Adam, to, who, as she repeats the voice, to turn against what God said. And what happens? They are immediately distant from God. They begin to hide from him in the very garden they were meant to share with him, and they're distant from one another. Adam begins to blame Eve. Eve begins to resent Adam and their children turn against each other, one killing the other. It's that division of men against woman, of child against parents that is the work of the devil. It's that division that rips the soul like the demoniac of the Garrodians who, who believed he could only find comfort standing in a graveyard, cutting himself away from all of his friends. That is the work of the devil. And it's the vision of people against people like Cain was against Abel. When one man or woman in the image of God looks at another different from them and says the world would be better without you and with me. This is the work of the devil. Lies that tell us we're not meant to be one together. Lies that tell us God is not there. Lies that tell us we are alone. And the torment of the demonic as presented in scripture shows a tale of torture, of darkness and confusion. And Jesus, as an illustration, says, this man suddenly was free from it. He had, he had some reformation of soul, maybe a moral turning, or, or maybe the demon decided, this, this guy's not worth it anymore, he's too lazy for me even to hunt, and leaves. And it's said that the demon goes off to a dry place, which is exactly what people believed at that time, that the deserts where humanity couldn't leave, live, that would be a good place for demons who didn't like life to be able to inhabit. And it says he comes back to this person when he finds that this person now is in better condition. 
he invites more and worse. One moment of clarity that he kept only to himself. He lost the evil in his life and turned nowhere towards the good. It was, it was repentance without restoration. We have to turn from something and towards something. And he says, this is like you Pharisees and this whole evil generation. They were confronted with divine power. They heard the divine words. They knew their empty lives. They saw the life of Christ. And as they turned away from the presence of the Spirit, replacing the things that were not fulfilling, nothing but the grimmest of futures awaited them. It was Jesus' point. Half efforts leave us in terrible spots. Being neutral in good and evil leave us in that car perpendicular with two highway full of traffic rushing in opposite directions around us. So what do we do? When things are completely antipolar, you cannot be both. Sure, there are times to be neutral, the stupid fight and argument, but there isn't a time when it comes between evil and good. One of my favorite theologians, Bob Dylan, wrote this in the song Precious Angel. He said, no, there's spiritual warfare, flesh and blood breaking down. You either got faith or you got unbelief, and there ain't no neutral ground. The enemy is subtle, howbeit we are deceived when the truth's in our hearts and we still don't believe. Maybe it wasn't in the Pharisees' hearts, but it was in their hands. They studied those scriptures to the point of counting letters. Jesus, when he challenged them in John chapter 5, would say, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have life, for these are they which testify of me, and you won't come to me that you may have life. The condemnation is not that they did evil. The condemnation is that they believed they could be justified in some other way than what God had provided, sending his son as their savior and sacrifice. And Jesus stands in a place that really is, is at cultural odds with America. He stands in a place of exclusivity. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Not every way leads to God. Not every road leads to the same mountain. He says, there's no other way because I am the way. No one comes to the Father but by me. And he doesn't say we can be sort of half-hearted about it. Jesus is frightening clear in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 24. He says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will love the one and hate the other or love, and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. His words. The decisions that we make for Christ run deeply. They're not just moral. Morality is a consequence of knowing our God. These are intimate relationships of the soul where Jesus comes to inhabit within us. When we walk with him and work with him and serve under him, we find not just a compartmentalized place of religion, not just a box on some identity to check to say I'm a Christian. We find ourselves, as St. Paul said, to be the very bond slaves of Jesus Christ. That as he speaks, we do, and where he doesn't, we don't. No neutral ground. It brings conviction, I believe, both to the follower and the non-follower to hear Jesus' words. You can't keep him in half measures. You can't keep a compartment or a pocket of Jesus in your life. It's all or nothing at all. You know, if COVID did anything for us, it helped us realize at least two big fears. Well, three, if you count, we're desperately afraid of not having toilet paper. But two, two other fears that we as humans walk around with. One is that things are out of control. What if we can't fix it? What if it's going faster than we can keep up with? What if we don't know the answers? What if the smartest kids in the room don't have anything to say to us? It's one of the fears. The other fear was, I might die. People were very self-concerned. What, what if I get this? Yes, people in Italy and China, but what if, what if I get this? Things are out of control, and I'm going to die. Can I suggest to you that COVID didn't create these circumstances? It just helped put a little light on them. That, yep, things are out of control. Your fear is real. Welcome to your nightmare. And, yep, you are going to die. As Mark Twain said, they'll mourn you for a day and forget you for a lifetime. And in the midst of this chaos, and in the midst of our mortality, all the more brightly Jesus shines. The one who is a sovereign, who said, I, I understand the evil in this world and I can defeat it. I have a plan to secure and save those who turn. 
and he offered his life in place of our certain deaths to tell us all who have me as their savior who take that penalty, you will have life. He came not to condemn the world, but the world might live through him. For as many as believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, not born of their father, the devil, not born of their society, their time, but born again of their creator to live with him. Satan will constantly bring words of darkness. They'll promote fear, they'll promote division, and ultimately they'll promote violence and destruction and separation. Jesus will bring action, the most notable one on the cross and out of the tomb, to tell us that he will repair the division, that the breach will be healed, that he will make of all one again in him. And he will call to you and say, oh, you of this evil generation, don't turn only to yourself. Don't think you can turn to evil without turning towards me. Don't think that somehow you can be saved in a salvation that God has not provided. We're going to have a moment to reflect on those acts that Jesus did on the cross and celebrate communion together. Uh, if you have your communion elements with you, please go ahead and, and get those out now and get those ready for you and your, your household. If you don't have them, if you would go to one of the greeting tables, I think there's one there, one here, and is, is there a third, Dennis? One back here. There, there, is, uh, there are communion elements that are available there, uh, and you can, you can pick those up. I'm going to give this one moment because uh, people are heading to get those. When we celebrate communion, we find ourselves always looking in three directions. We, we look back, and we hear the words of Jesus on that Passover night when he told the tale in a different way than Jews were used to hearing it. The people around his table were used to understanding the sacrificial lamb that was put over the doorpost of the homes of the people fleeing from slavery in Egypt to keep them safe. And Jesus says, that, that's my blood. And he, and he takes bread and breaks it and says, this, this is my body, which will be broken for you so that sins be forgiven. We always look back. We, we look right here. The scriptures make it very clear that if you're coming to this place of, of union with Jesus, a place where you again celebrate the forgiveness you can have, the life you can have in his death, and you have sin in your life, that it's time to deal with that. That it may mean that you actually say, right now I, I can't, I need to make some things right in my life and set that aside. And God says, take that seriously. It may mean that some of you are, are committing now to, to make some things right, to contact some people, whether here or after this service, to be able to make those things right. And we always look forward, because Jesus said he desired this dinner to happen with us when he would return. And we celebrate this until that day. It becomes a picture of the great family meal when every tribe, tongue, and nation, secure and saved in Jesus, will celebrate. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, and after he had given thanks to God for the food and for the great plan that God was unveiling, he took it and broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Freely he gave that we can freely receive. Likewise, when the supper is over, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Freely, Jesus, the Son of God, shed his blood for us that we could freely be forgiven. Father in heaven, we come before you as sinners and saints, as the lost and the saved, as those made in the image of God, as prodigals who are invited to return. O oh Lord, help us not to be that obstruction in traffic that's perpendicular on a highway. O oh Lord, help us not to drive the wrong way and tell ourselves it's okay. Father, would you help us, give us grace to orient our lives, not just in some small improvement, but a life that's dedicated to following Jesus. God, we're grateful for your Holy Spirit that works in each of us to show us how different that will play out and empowers us to be able to turn from sin and turn towards our Savior. Jesus, in whose name we now pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand uh, and let's respond to hearing the word uh, through worship.
Just to announce that we actually do take our offering at this time usually, but uh, ways to give are still the options to text and go online and give those ways. We won't physically be giving here any time in the very near future. Um, as we figure out how that works, um, we will let you know. Um, but let's close declaring that Jesus is better than all the things that we could possibly put in front of him. He is better than COVID. He is better than all the things that keep us from getting together. So let's sing as we go today, church. sure and steady my hope is held in your hand when castles crumble and breath is fleeting upon this rock I will stay upon this rock I will stay Glory, glory, we have no other king but Jesus, the Lord of all. And raise the anthem, our loudest praises ring, we crown him a Lord of all. 
Your kindly rule has shattered and broken the curse of sin steering. My life is hidden beneath heaven shadow. Your crimson flood covers me. is better make my heart believe in all my victories Jesus is better make my heart believe any comfort than any comfort Jesus is better More than all riches, Jesus is better. Have a seat. Dennis has a few announcements for us this morning. Take it away. He told me to take it away, so I'm taking it away. Good afternoon, Terra. My name is Dennis Gardner. I serve as the operations director at Terra in Troy. Um, whether you attend regularly or this is your first introduction to us or if you're watching us live online, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, there's one thing we always like to let you know that Terra Nova is primarily about making Jesus known and revealing him for who he is. And we hope uh, that you experience that in some degree this morning. Uh, we have one announcement uh, for the gentlemen of our church, actually, for our Imago men's group. Um, if you have likely already heard that our annual men's retreat has been canceled, uh, you may be justifiably upset about that, as we all are, but don't have to say why. Uh, so our Imago team has been has been working together so that we can find a way to meet in some kind of uh, COVID-compliant capacity. 
Uh, to that end, please mark your calendars on Saturday, September 19th. We're going to have an outdoor get-together at a rented pavilion at Peebles Island Park in Cohoes. This is going to be a casual time for the guys to get together. There will be some activities, including a, a short hike, kayaking, fishing, and, of course, cornhole. Uh, lunch will also be supplied at that time, so that's a good thing. So please, gentlemen, mark your calendars. Again, that's going to be September 19th. Boy, they weren't kidding about this wind. Uh, there will also be a time set aside there for Pastor Ed to, to speak to the men of Terra Nova Church. So again, mark your calendars. There's also going to be an event in October. The date is still yet to be determined, which will be a, um, a moderate Adirondack hike. So I would encourage you gentlemen to keep an eye on uh, the website, keep an eye on our social media outlets and your email inbox for information on that. Um, uh, two other little pieces. Uh, one, if you wouldn't mind as we leave, just take, a, just take a look around the area and police the area if you could. Please don't leave your lyric sheets behind or little communion things. I mean, um, we want to be a good witness to the city, not just by our presence, but by our actions. So uh, please just take a look around. There are garbage cans over there in the corner. Um, if you'd also like to hang around and help us tear some of this stuff down, some of the heavy lifting, you can see myself or Pastor Rob afterwards. And finally, uh, there's going to be an opportunity. Some of the pastors and their wives and some of the other church leaders are going to be over in this corner, um, in the corner of the tent, and they'll be available uh, to pray for you. If there's something that you want to pray with, uh, with one of our pastors, they will make themselves available for some time. Uh, let's leave this time today with a benediction, and a benediction has been from Numbers chapter 6, and it says this, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen, church? Amen. Have a great week.